This is Musical Talk. Musical Talk. The UK's independent musical theatre podcast. Musical Musical Talk. Talk. The UK independent musical theatre podcast. Hello, I'm at my home away from home, the Royal Festival Hall. Um, I'm sat here with Daniel Hope. Hello, Daniel Hope. Hello. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. A little wet, it's very rainy outside. It's glorious, isn't it? um, We're just chatting before we started. I've just come from Manchester, where I saw Little Shop of Horrors, where... I grew up, yes. Your neck of the woods. Ain't it cold? Oh, my goodness. I forget, and every time I go home, I bring, like, my London layers, and then I get home, and I'm like, oh, my goodness, I need to wear two coats. The Royal Exchange is amazing, though. That's one of my favourite places. And then you had to buy a hat. (laughs) I walked out of Primark because it was so... (laughs) Yeah, so I saw the Little Triple Cars at the Royal Exchange. um, Wonderful show, and it was was done in a round. Yes. Which is always rare. Well, it's never been done for that show, I don't know. No, no. You forgive the noise. They seem to be rebuilding the venue while we're here. But um, I just thought Daniel and I would have a little chat. Uh, For those of you who don't know who Daniel Hope is, let's... Danielle, you can explain how you were thrust into the living rooms of 12 million people. Oh, I like that, thrust yeah. into the living rooms. Um, I didn't come down the chimney. Um, it was on the screen I did Over the Rainbow with the BBC, um, which is a search for Dorothy, and won that. And that was almost five years ago now. Oh, my goodness. And, yeah, little did I know, five years ago, I'd be sat here in the Royal Festival Hall. Um, or even living in London. Neither did I. No. Yeah, so I, I did that, and then I was Eponine in Les Mis. Uh, I did Cathy in the last five years and then most recently the narrator and Joseph Joseph and now yeah. you're off to the other TV show yes Maria which is the first one of the Andrew Lloyd Webber programmes wasn't it yes it's not the same production though is it or no is it's it? not no it's a completely new production new design new set new concept new songs new, yeah you imagine it's really exciting we open on Thursday so I get into the theatre for the first time this evening uh, and where's that Bromley we start in Bromley we have four days there um so excited. The, the, to... These tours just sound exhausting because the minute you've settled into your digs and you you get to know everyone, it's like getting a truck with going off yeah, to, to it's moving somewhere again. else. I mean, um, Sound of Music is sitting down everywhere for two weeks, whereas Joseph, we did a week. Um, but I don't know which is the less of two evils, really, because a yeah. week you don't have time to settle at all. Two so weeks, you get so moving. settled. Yeah, and we, we did two weeks in Dublin with Joseph, and... Um, I remember just starting to think, okay, I've got a bit of a routine now, I know where I like want to be, and then all of a sudden it was like, oh, it's time to move, and I got a little bit emotional, because I was like, I'm not ready. I but saw the original Joseph. Did you? Not the original, but, but um, the, the, the Palladium one in about yes. 20... Um, with Lindsay Hately. With Lindsay Hately. Who played my Madame T in uh, Les Mis. Oh. Yes. And our very own Mike Dixon conducting. Really? Yes. I think this will be another experience. Um, I'm doing six months, uh, and just to kind of find out which is better. Well, I think, I guess, just having two weeks in one theatre, even if it's just, you don't have to repack your dressing room. But it's when you're in the West End, you don't really think about obviously moving anything because when you're there, you're there for however long your contract is, or however long you hope that your contract is. <laughs> and um, whereas touring, it's uh, it's like an added stress, I think. But I didn't really think about that before I started touring. I just thought, and Joseph was ten s- shows a week. Um, it's another so, skill to learn, isn't absolutely, it? Absolutely, yeah. And you kind of think, okay, so lots of sleep, definitely required. Well, not and much smart sleep. travel, smart travel plans, I think, like you've experienced with the Virgin Trains. Yes, thank you, Virgin Trains. Well, we won't go into that, no. but um, I want to cast your mind back to, though, was it five years ago? Yes. Yes. Just tell me everything. I, I mean, mean I, I guess the main thing, it was televised, so you have the memories of that, it. That's the thing. Yeah. You know, I've never watched it back, though. Oh, okay. Um, I think I just wanted to keep my experience as the one that I I saw through my own eyes and that I experienced. And I think watching it back might freak me out a little bit, just to be like, oh, is that what everyone was watching? Like, Because I don't know how it was all edited together and, and, and all of that. But because, you know, we did the live performances, I was like, okay, I'll try to treat it as if it was just a live show. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it was about this time, exactly now, okay. five years ago, that I would have had like my first audition. And and then it went to from like 9,000 to 100. And then we all came to London, went to Hackney, Hackney Empire, and we did an, an audition there. And then the final 50, we got put on a bus and taken somewhere. I don't know where we were. We weren't the told. Blindfolded. On, like, honestly, and then told to change T-shirts. Oh, okay. and so the little green ones with the Dorothy with a question mark on. Um, and we went on, and then we got dropped off at this other station, and then we got on another bus, and we got somewhere else. So it's like my so journey really, Yes, right. absolutely. So really disorientated. It's the middle of this farm, and they call it Dorothy Farm, I think, on the programme, for a weekend, for a long weekend, where 
we did um, training with Andrew Lloyd Webber and with Claire Morton from the vocal coach and, and Donna the acting coach and just everyone Kevin Allen and we did loads of training and loads of songs and it's like in preparation for a final performance that would then whittle down to the final 20 and there just wasn't a moment to stop and actually like take any but, kind of that, stock that's really interesting because you think I watched The Apprentice and I, I think oh me too <laughs> like how can they get a phone call at five o'clock in the morning and saying you're ready you're leaving for Chiswick in half an yes. hour and they all look that good I mean you just think there's more going on here but that's interesting how it really was as disorientating as you oh, say oh absolutely it's, it's not kind of like art attack here's one I made earlier yeah. like you know it, it was definitely um, on the spot and on the go and all the missions that we did every week because I don't know if you remember but there was like a, a mission every Wednesday we would film and it would get put in the middle of the programme and they were like full day events so really we only had two days of rehearsal and prep for the final performance on the Saturday and then you'd spend the whole day of the Friday you know teching if you like for that show um, what was interesting was the way my brain and body worked like during and after the programme because every all the information we took in so quickly was then disposed of instantly and then new information and and it was funny then starting rehearsals for the actual show The Wizard of Oz and going through all that process and all previews. that creativity and previews and getting to press night and it feeling like the final where you do it and then you discard everything, it's done. Whereas it was like press night, oh right, okay, now you have to maintain that level mm. for the whole year. And again, that was something I'd never had to do. Like, you know, at school you do like a week or something in the high school of shows. Because you were quite program. young, weren't you? Yeah, I was 17 on the programme and then 18 by the time I came out. I had my 18th birthday on one of the live shows. So did, did that, I wonder if that beat, beat out Emma Williams from, she was the youngest person to perform a, a lead role in Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. Oh, was she? I think at the time. I think she was 16 when she did that. Oh, wow. Which is oh, quite my a, goodness, a really? That's you Northern lovely. girls, you can just... Oh, my God, I know. <laughs> Plumbing it. It's a heck of a prize, isn't it, to play a the most iconic, arguably one of the most iconic roles in ever, ever at the most iconic theatre ever yeah. in a sort of new musical by the most iconic musical theatre composer yes. ever. That wasn't in your mind, though. I'm guessing, or was no. it? Just all of that was like, oh, oh, and it's more in retrospect now that I look back and I think, oh my goodness, did I do all of those things with all of those people? And at the time, it was just like, okay, just do your best, be really focused, work hard, learn this, do this, do that. And I didn't ever stop to kind of sit back and like relish in it, which I think was a good thing though, because I just kept looking on and forward and yeah. trying to just take each day as it came, you know. But, uh, but in retrospect, now I think, wow, and like Michael Crawford is like yeah, I want a, to... another father to me, like, you know, he's um, a huge, huge part of my life. And. I am Ask so him to thankful. tell you about his EFX show from Las Vegas. His EFX show, okay. We've touched on it briefly, but I want to hear I, it. I saw a documentary about it, and this was back in the mid-90s, and it was the most expensive show of oh, all wow. time. It had two dragons in it, both a, million, both a million dollars each, having a fight with each other. <gasps> I shall pick his brain next time it, I see him. It's so Vegas. Oh, um, wow. But j just so... Yeah, and also, just to add more amazingness to it, you're going to be with Michael Crawford playing yes, a wizard. I know. Like, what? I remember he... Um, he this is so funny. The first time I met him, we, <laughs> we just had a little chat and he gave me um, a pair of red slippers, like hotel slippers. He said, I've just come from somewhere. Um, and these were in there and I thought of you. And he gave them to me and he'd signed them. And I was like, that's a strange present, but thank you. And, and it wasn't ones. until about three months later that I realised ruby slippers and they were red slippers and that was the joke and it took me about three months I think I was in such shock of meeting him that I was like that's in my head I was like that's a really strange gift to give me but okay I'll just so what, what, was this before you knew you were going to be with him in oh, the yes, show yes like, literally right. the first time meeting him so it's like yeah. a, a, a clue a clue and I was like oh I, I thought you were going to say they were the real ruby slippers from the no, film no they were just like hotel slippers but they were red and it, I just, it's still so funny I've still got them obviously um, but yeah, just to wear the ruby slippers and walk on the Elbert Road. And it, it was it was very brave of Andrew to not edit the score, but write more stuff. Add new to music, it. absolutely. But I think it really worked um, because there isn't actually that much music 
in the Wizard of Oz. Um, and I think I, as an on-stage musical, it was really craving that 11 o'clock number, especially the one yeah. you know that he wrote for Glinda and Dorothy. And I love that. Which and was in it, then it wasn't in it, and then. Oh yes, it was in and out, and in and out, and I, you know, at the interval, sometimes we were like, "Is it in? Is it out? We don't know." You know, well, that's the joy of theatre, isn't it? And yeah, so it, thank goodness it, it stayed in in the end because we loved it. And you got a beautiful cast recording out of it as well. Oh, yes. So you kind of won the dream. Absolutely, it was like a whole package. Did, did, did you sit there thinking, and I mean this in the politest possible yes. way, how will it ever top this? Yes, it was. I think someone said to me actually, you've you've come in at, at such a level, and like you know the London it's like writing the your hit role. show being the first one, isn't it? Yes, absolutely, and it's kind of like how do you sustain that? And I think these days success is um, longevity, and how do you just keep going? And you know, I didn't put any pressure on myself, and I kept having to remind myself because I'm my own worst enemy that like I was only 18 or 19 by the time I came out of the program, and instead of being like why aren't I doing this why aren't I doing that it's like actually I've done a hell of a lot very very early I wouldn't have even graduated drama school by this point you know even when I did Les Mis um, I wouldn't have even finished you know my three year degree by the time I'd finished those two massive jobs so I had to learn to kind of like give myself a bit of a break because I was very hard on myself and, and you yeah. at art said as well yes I yeah. did yeah because I was auditioning for drama schools at the same time as auditioning for Dorothy but I never got to any of the drama schools because I was doing the program so Andrew said go week. to my school so I, well I asked I oh. said it's really important to me if I go to drama school and I'd met by chance Chris Hocking the, the head of um, musical theatre at art said um, in a bar in Chiswick like in, a, in Balance in Chiswick I was closed. having dinner with someone yes closed yes um, and I, I met him and I'd said, you know, I went over, this was like, there was still six or seven girls left. And I said, I'm really sorry I missed my audition. He didn't have a clue, obviously, who I was, you yeah. know, nobody. And um, I said, I'm really sorry I missed my audition and I really hope I can come and audition again once I, you know, whenever I come out of this programme. And he was like, I'm sure we can, you know, sort something out or find a place for you to audition. So I was kind of like, okay, thank you. So when I did win, I said to Andrew, I've got about six months between this and rehearsals can I go and do some training? And he said, you know, I have a lot to do with that said. And I, st- I joined the second years. So I went straight in and in the deep end again. Like, it seems I, like, can't dive. I can't swim underwater. more stressful than I seem to w- constantly be diving in. Oh. But, yeah, so it was amazing. And that's what made London home mm. because I didn't know anyone when I first moved here for Dorothy. And when I went to Artside, I actually had a group of like-minded people of the same age, um, you know, all striving the same thing and it was just a really lovely welcoming building and they could have easily been like who are you we've you know paid to be here and we're here for three years and yeah. you're just dropping in like it doesn't work like that but the vibe wasn't like that at all and I prepared myself for the worst as you do but I don't think I'm the type of person to come into a situation and feel like you know, the world owed me something or you know I kind of went in like thank you so much for letting me come in and join your classes you know I was terrified I was terrified there's something very special about that school and it's um you know we talked about it on the show before what was it that gave you that the palladium didn't in a way if you see what i mean How yeah did it, did i think probably the opportunity to fail and to fall um and just various techniques because obviously with the palladium and wizard of Oz, i was training and rehearsing for one role and one specific you know, tasks. So everything that I learned on that job for that role, I'll have forever. But Artside gave me lots of different um, skills and yeah. techniques and things for you know the rest of life. And yeah, if I'd gone for three years, I would have learned a hell of a lot more. But what it did give me was a foundation and a base for my mind as well in London, so that I felt confident and assured enough to walk into the first day of rehearsals and think, okay. I know I, I've got this, like I can do this. Like singing the last five years is very different to singing Over the Rainbow, I'm Isn't sure. Isn't it? Arts. And Les Mis, like yeah. singing on my own is completely different. And I've kind of been blessed and, and challenged very much so in going different vocal styles. And actually, Maria now, whoo, the child agrees. Talk, speaking of. Um, Maria is the most, the closest to my natural voice. 
I would say, and the thing that I would find most natural to do. So, and it, it's hard with with Maria and Dorothy to not be influenced by certain other performers. Absolutely, because like Julie Andrews is my hero. Like my hero, Mary Poppins is my ultimate ultimate role. Like that that would be the be all end all for me. I could do that. It's touring the country um, again. I've heard, yes. yes. <laughs> and um, you could and, do two and shows. Maria, so, can you imagine. Oh, and, and Maria likewise, and she has such a beautiful transformation throughout the two. They're, acts. they're similar characters in a way, if, apart from the sternness. Yes. You know, they're haughty British nannies in a way. Yes, exactly. And I think this Maria will be my first womanhood kind of role, and it's kind of that transition into being a grown adult. Up. Yeah, a grown up, exactly, and, and given that responsibility. And, and you actually see Maria transform into the grown up throughout the show, which I think for me is perfect. Mm. Perfect. But it's funny because I'm actually approaching it the younger, youthful, more innocent, naive scenes, I've actually found the most challenging. Whereas the older side, I found more natural, which is very bizarre. But. So, where else are you heading on this tour? We are, so we open in Bromley and then we go to Southampton. And then Mayflower? We, yes, yes, which I've never been to. Neither Apparently have I. it's massive. Um, so I'm excited for that. And then we go on to Sheffield. I think that's the closest in those six months that I'll get to Manchester. So again, come on, Virgin, I'm depending on you. I've got a commute. We're Please not affiliated with it without said or Virgin on this show at all, no, don't worry. No. <laughs> It might not even be there. It might be like Trans Pennine or something. Anyway, public transport of the north, please be with me. Um, and then I actually have a week off because I have my American debut, my yeah. solo concert okay. at 54 Below in New York. Awesome. On Friday the 13th. Great Good date. Luck. Thank you very much. You're welcome. So I have that, the second week of Sheffield out of the show. And then I fly from New York to Glasgow. And I've never done Scotland either. So that'll I be... I hope you got a couple of days off between flying... Just York. one day, yeah. but I'm fine with jet lag. It doesn't doesn't bother me anymore. It's fine. Wait to get older. <laughs> It'll catch up with me. Yes. But um, yeah, so, so that's exciting. So we're doing Scotland. We're doing Belfast and Dublin, Bristol. Just it, and and it's amazing how it's a show that can still sustain a tour of these lengths oh, because yeah. it's only just left London, it seemed, because it played outside in the park. Yeah. And it had obviously the successful played in run and that toured and stuff it, what is it about that show because I'm not the biggest fan of Rodgers and Hammerstein okay I think probably 60 years ago I probably would have been a huge fan obviously yeah. but I love the sound of music though it has my theory is because it's got kids in it which I think is always the best thing you can yeah, do in any show it? yeah but, but you obviously know the piece you come at it from a different angle than I have so what's your theory as to why it's yeah. so sustainable I think, and I think there's about many shows that are still, you know, in the West End or like and long running. In the canon. Is it comes from truth, and this is a real part of history. This is a real family, and yes, it's romanticised and it's glorified with music and, and beautiful sets. And the war. But, and the war, you know, but this really happened to a family and like you say, when you look at it from a child's point of view as well, and then you have the mother and you have the abbey and the captain, you kind of have all of these different viewpoints on it and no matter who you are or what background you come from, you connect with somebody or in some way because you you kind of view it as the family I think and as well with everyone's connection, like The Wizard of Oz, I had the exact same kind of conversations when doing fact. that. Which isn't based on fact. No, I wish I'm not it um, existed. But in terms of the family connection, the childhood, the, the films are so well known. And it's such a huge part of people's lives that I think it's a familiarity with it. And people just, it takes them back to wherever mm. that film or that story took them I, I have to say when Wizard of Oz was opening I was on a bus with um, the lovely 94 bus uh, I think going to see the Wizard of Oz I think and there were people behind me saying oh, do you know they've done a prequel to Wicked oh my goodness oh my goodness so that sums up uh, everything <laughs> that's wrong bus. in the world I think yes oh wow oh wow um, but I yes <laughs> So funny. I'll just leave that with you for. Thank you. I'll, I'll take that one. Away but, I mean, with do, me. I presume you've seen Wicked. Do you think no, it's not how it happened? I have. And you see Wizard of Oz. Think no, that's not what really happened. No. 
shows the power of the Wizard of Oz as well as a, it really does. You know, we'll have a prequel to the Sound of Music soon. Could you imagine? No. We won't. no. Before the Abbey. I hope it goes well. Um, Thank you. And it does seem like a bit of a you know real slog to get it on, and especially do that those songs. Oh yeah, every night. and we put it together in like two and a half weeks, and um, I'm really really like proud of it. And you know I'm in no way have any ownership over the role. I'm just carrying the bat on until the next person takes it. And I kind of I've had that with a lot of the roles I've done because I've you know. Dorothy, just it's like you're looking after it. I mean, so many people who've done it before you, and people who will continue to do it, and you just got to kind of go in and do your spin on it and have a, a good time. And I love to look at the kids, and they're just loving it, and I kind of take a leaf out of their book mm. and just, you know, nothing to prove, only to share. That's it's lovely. And just, you know. And, and do you? Are there any dream apart from Mary Poppins? I hope you can um, step into her <laughs> shoes again. What other dream worlds are there out there for you? Um, Natalie in Next to Normal mm-hmm. has been been one. I, just, I don't see that ever coming here. Though. Neither do I, no. but in my mind. Um, but there's always hope. You know, you never know. But anyway. But but if you're doing the New York thing, is that a are you trying to break into there as into the, into Broadway? I as mean, well? it's always been one of those lifelong achievements of mine to live in New York. I've always felt so at home there, um, and it was on my kind of like dream list of things to do as was to live in London and to perform in a musical one day and I didn't realise that I would achieve those two things so the New York thing is, I guess is becoming a little bit more like a reality and it's a huge thing for me to be doing in February for myself like that's like a life achievement like it might not be in a Broadway show but for a solo you know concert yeah. or below it's so cool to know like amazing um, so yeah, that would be something definitely for the future. I'd love to go and work over there. I'd really. Do work. you do you think inherently there's a difference between going to the theatre in New York and going to the theatre as an audience member in London? Because I much prefer it in London. Do you? It's much more relaxed here. I do get it's much more relaxed because I think you're herded in in New York. Well, we have the front of house space, don't we? Yeah. Because our theatres are so old, whereas theirs aren't as old as ours, and they don't have any like box office front of house space. No. You like queue around the building, and but I guess for me it's like a grass is greener thing. Like I was like my American friends, like oh my god, London, the West End, and I'm like Broadway. It just feels it's exactly the same, but it just feels. I don't know, more magical. Yeah, but it then it's just because London is like home, isn't it, of theatre? But I think it, I was walking around the West End when I get back from the Joseph tour, and I'd not been in central London for a while, and I was so inspired because I saw so many different shows. And like the Scottsdale Boys had come in, Memphis had come in, Maiden Dagenham had come in, as well as our staples with the Phantom and the Les Mis and Sagan was there. And I was just like, this is really exciting. Like, and even if things don't run for 30 years, they're still getting on and up. And that was so exciting to me because I think that's the thing with Broadway is I always go and there's always something different on. And I just came into the West End and I was like, this is amazing. Like, new things are getting a chance. And that's. Well, things in America are getting a chance. Yes. Um, it's it's a bit of a sad state for British writing, but I think Maiden Dagenham is is good, and I hope that that keeps open because that is yes. it's a very refreshing show. Um, what is gratifying is that Matilda's made its money back on Broadway, which is amazing. Yes, to go there and see that and Australia and yeah, the US tour and stuff. And, it's brilliant. Uh, um, I just I just wonder what the next big thing will be. Hopefully. Mary Poppins will make its come back to London where oh, she belongs. Wouldn't that be a because dream. That, that would be absolutely lovely. Wouldn't it? Oh. So keep an eye out open for that casting yes. because I, yes. you know, it's certainly a role I could see you doing. Oh, it just. You know, every nanny in the world you could you can go and play. <laughs> yeah. All the nannies come to me. Oh. Um, and we hope that we can uh, have a chat soon and have a Yes, have I a hope lo- so. Have a lovely time in New York. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are you seeing, do you have any plans to see any shows there? Or are you just well, I, have there a week, the... I have a week there, but I've got to do a lot of rehearsals because um, I won't have rehearsed with the, you know, the band or anything until I get there. But my dad's coming over, my mm-hmm. sister, uh, while I'm flying them. They're coming over um, to, to watch the concert, and they've never been to New York before. Okay. I'm so excited. Has Andrew put them on his jet? No, he has not. Oh. I've done it. <laughs> put, them on, put them on your, put oh, them on no, your jet. Oh, no, I wish. My jet, in the shape of a British Airways plane, yes. Lovely. Um, 
do do try and see some stuff there. It's, yes, it's no, I will, I will. Um, February's yeah. always quite good as well because a lot of things are previewing, aren't they? And have a lovely time. Thank and we'll speak you. to you soon, Daniel. Yes, thank you very much. Um,